Hey, good Thursday, everybody. Welcome to the Ball Quest Mailbag Podcast. I am Eric Kane, alongside Matt Ray, Brent Hubs, and Rob Lewis. It's presented, as always, by our friends, Exterior Home Solutions. If you need roofing, siding, windows, or a garage, contact Exterior Home Solutions today. They've been local and trusted since 1999. For a free estimate, give them a call at 865-524-5888 or visit them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. Got a whole lot of questions to get into, a lot of recruiting questions, a lot of uh, Tennessee football team questions here on the bye week. We'll go ahead and start with Nashville 615. In your opinion, Brent, is the lack of deep shots due to Joe not being able to read the defense, wide receivers underperforming, or offensive line problems? Yes. I don't know there's so much Joe being able to read the defense. Um, I, I think that, that Joe probably reads it pretty well. I, I would like to see Joe maybe get the ball out of his hands a little faster from time to time. I don't think there's just been a ton of those where you go, man, that guy was 10 yards behind him and Joe didn't throw him the ball. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of teams are playing split safeties, trying to roll coverage over the top, take away the deep shots. I think they've had some deep shots called. Pass protection hasn't been good enough to hold up um, at times. I think the receivers have dropped a couple of balls at times. Um, they just they just haven't got they haven't got the top off of it. They haven't got it explosive at, at this point. And um, you wonder with the run game going, Rob, the way it is, do teams have to suddenly start committing extra people to the box? And, and does that change how that looks? I mean, you go back and look at that South Carolina game. There were three or four occasions where it was third and five, and Tennessee counted numbers and ran for a first down. Do teams say, you know what, we're not going to let this happen? And does that open up some some more deep shots with this team? I mean, I think it has to. I mean, just I mean, just common sense. I mean, I, you know, I mean, Florida did did not have to do it. Um, I mean, they they were, you know, we talked about that at Lick. I mean, Florida was able to stop them with a light box, and you know, I I, I just again I go back. I think that was a horrible game for Tennessee, but I. I think you lean on the ground game, and I think it will open things up for Joe. I mean, we, Tennessee's only played two SEC games. I mean, it feels like the season's almost halfway over, but, you know, we're barely in the conference play. And and I think you're going to see – I mean, if Tennessee can, you know, run for 200-plus like they did against South Carolina, no, I don't know if that's going to happen every night out. But, I mean, teams are going to have to make an adjustment. I mean, you can't – if Tennessee's able to average six, six yards a carry, then, I mean, there's not going to be need, need to worry about Joe Milton. And the back half of this question here from Nashville 615 is, can you win nine games like this? And to your point, Rob, if Tennessee runs for over 200 yards a game, yeah, you, you can. can win, because... You can win 10 or 11 games like that. You know, but, Matt, if Tennessee is shut down and Tennessee can't run the football like at Florida, then you're going to need to complete some deep shots. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you can't live in this offense without having success in the vertical passing game. You, you can win ball games, but eventually teams are going to adjust and take the run away. And when they do, then you're going to run into those knots like you had at Florida. But, you know, to Tennessee's credit, I just think it was a really bad night. You know, we'll see what happens the rest of SEC play. They, look, they looked really good against South Carolina in the run game. And I thought on some of the stuff they called intermediate, you know, it, it looked better in the passing game as well. And, and interestingly, against Florida, they probably took more deep shots than they have against anybody else. They hit yeah. squirrel on a switch route early <clears throat> for completion. They miss Keaton down the right sideline on the second offensive possession, maybe. Yeah. Um, Dante Thornton had one he almost caught, and then he they came right back, back to him. I mean, that's that's four deep shots just without looking at the play by play. The 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 sack or the interception that came off of pressure was a deep shot as well. They they actually took probably more deep shots in the Florida game than they have any other game this season. Um, they just didn't connect with them very well. Yeah, they he hit Brew for a touchdown against... in that game as well. Yeah, he hit Brew yeah. on a deep shot in that game. They took a half dozen deep shots in that mm -hmm. game, I bet. And hit three. I mean, yeah. big plays. Yep. And, and I mean, Thornton should have been pass interference, the one, the, the first one. I mean, he, he was kind of hanging all over him, so pretty productive there. Uh, let's go to Athron. He's got a couple of recruiting questions or a couple of questions overall, Matt. Uh does Tennessee go hard after any JUCO defensive lineman, assuming uh, Tennessee <clears> will need a couple of older guys on the line? Uh, with the guys that they could potentially lose. You actually spoke about this in Trail Tidbits earlier in the week, uh, about three of them Tennessee's interested in. Yeah, I think Tennessee's interested in all three of the JUCO defensive linemen they recently offered. Jamal Wallace, Kamari Copeland, and Brian Taylor. It's about getting those guys to campus, and that's easier said than done when they're also playing football on Saturdays. 
Wallace is scheduled for a November 18th official visit. Uh, Copeland's working on a visit and Taylor's working on a visit. I, I think you have a chance to get all of them here. And I think for Tennessee, that kind of dictates how much you push in. You, you want to use that official visit to learn more about those guys. And I think they'll get out on the road and see those guys as well. But I think all three of those guys are in play right now. Do you think the coaches are going to go see uh, Seton uh, for his game this week? Of course, the bye week, they're going to be all over the country. They're, they're going to be all over the country, and i, I got to think there's a pretty good chance you go see Jordan Seaton. I heard, haven't heard anything concrete yet, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, IMG has had scheduling issues, so how many more games are they going to play here in this in this regular season and had teams canceling on them, you know, teams backing out in the last minute. But it seems like their game this week is a go, so you have to think there's a chance Tennessee goes and sees Jordan Seaton and continues to try to build on that momentum. But we'll see how they time those things out. Um, you're looking to get him back to campus mid-November, so do you wait you know, and, and try to go see him later on? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that just yet. They didn't ask my advice, but uh, coming off the visit last weekend and you're off this weekend, I would go see him. That's just me. Yeah, I would too. Uh, Brent, do you think that uh, Tennessee's able to bring in a transfer quarterback that you want to come in here or that's taking kind of the coaching path? Uh, you need to get more than two scholarship quarterbacks. We've talked about this for a couple of years now, it feels like, and Tennessee's going to be in that situation again. The challenge, Brent, I feel like, is finding a guy that's like, okay, I'll come, not going to play, want to be a coach. There's not too many of those guys out there. Well, is that guy, if you find that guy, is he better than Gaston Moore? I think that's the question you're asking. Is, yeah. is a transfer guy who's third team somewhere else who wants to be a future coach, is he a better option as the third team quarterback or is Gaston Moore the better option, a guy who's been in your program uh, for three years and knows your offense inside and out? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's the question you have to ask unless you're in a really unusual situation and, and somebody has some tie that brings them and, and wants them to be a part of Tennessee. But I, I'm not I'm not aware of, of anything like that lingering out there right now. I, I think it's going to be hard to get a transfer in. I know everybody goes, well, look at Ole Miss. They took four. They did. They took four in a group that was not established. Nobody knew who the quarterback was going to be. Nico's not established on the field, but does anybody in the in the recruiting world believe Nico's not going to be the quarterback at Tennessee next year? I don't. No. I mean, everybody no. thinks he's the guy next year, which is going to make it hard to get a transfer. Uh, Rob, what do you think is more likely with Brew out? Wide receiver by committee to replace him or more Jacob Warren on the outside? It, it could be a little bit of both of this. I know that we've talked about Jacob Warren being more active in the passing game, but it feels like they're going to you know, have a couple different guys in there, in there to try to replace a Brew McCoy. Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be by committee. I, mean, I, I think, and, and my opinion is based on how much they just you know find the, their top three wide receivers or whatever and ride with them. I think you're going to see Squirrel and Ramel Keaton get a ton more targets. I mean, you know, somebody else is going to play that and get more snaps and reps and otherwise. But I think you're going to see their workload go way up. And Hubbard is the first one I saw mention it. What you're talking about with Jacob Warren, I think because of you know how physical Brew was out there. I mean, I think he you, you kind of get more of an, an equivalent of a as a, of a tight end. You know, with the the physicality that he played with out there. So, I mean, I, I can see the tight ends picking up some of that slack, but I, I think at the end of the day, more work for Squirrel, more work for Keaton. Yeah, I was a little surprised Josh Heupel, Eric, was kind of pretty clear that it was plug and play. Now, he didn't say who they were plugging and playing no, he did not. How, many, how many people they were going to plug and play with, but he was like, yeah. we're going to do what we do, next man up type deal. We'll see if they can do that. I, the, the, all the little things that Brew McCoy does and did for this team, I, I think, are, are going to be harder to replace than just plugging and playing a guy in there. Yeah, I mean, last year we thought it was going to be a little bit by committee, but then Romel Keaton came in and then he never left. If you look at just the South Carolina game specifically after Brew left, you had Webb, you had Nimrod, you, I mean, you had Nimrod in the slot. I mean, Dante Thornton wasn't available, uh, but he would have been out there at some point in time. Somewhere, I mean, again, it's uh, may, maybe they get to that point, but if you look at South Carolina in the second half, they were playing two guys. So yeah, you know, but we'll, you also you also had Matt when when said went down and got hurt in that Akron game. You had seen enough of Brew McCoy to know that he could play, right? Touchdown pass yeah. against Pittsburgh, great feet work <clears throat> work there. 
Now, Jalen Hyatt hadn't gone off for five touchdowns against Alabama yet, but he was clearly a guy that was a problem for defenses. They were more, to me, they were more established at the receiver position when Cedric Tillman got hurt last year. I agree. Than, than they are right now at, at the receiver position. There, yeah. there, there was much more of a threat with them a year ago when, when Tillman went down than there is right now, in my opinion. Yeah, no, yeah. I think you're 100 percent right. I mean, I'm sorry, Matt, but I was going to say, remember, I mean, coming out of camp last August, I mean, Heifel was raving about, you know, Jalen Hyatt. You know, Kelsey Pope was raving about Jalen Hyatt. You know, this what he, nobody knew was saying he was going to be a Blitnikoff winner, but people were high on Jalen Hyatt coming out of August. Yeah, you need Dante Thornton to take a step. I mean, that that's that's my thing. You need Dante Thornton to take a step. It's there. It hasn't even flashed yet, though. Um, to this point, I mean, he he's got the size, he's got the speed. He needs to put it together for Tennessee in the back half of the season. And I think that can – it's not going to – like you said, Brett, there's so many little things that Brew McCoy does for Tennessee that I don't – I think goes unnoticed. But I think Dante Thornton can definitely add a different element on the outside if if, he, if they're if they're willing to play him there. You know, if not, then I think it's got to be by committee. Chaz Nimrod, Thornton, and, and Webb. Um. One of those things you talk about that just kind of goes unseen that we don't even think about, and you don't have Princeton fan anymore. Now you don't have Brew McCoy anymore. It's that blocking on all those screen RPOs. I mean, they are great blockers. Brew McCoy is such a good blocker, so we'll have to see how that injury affects that part of the game. Maybe they will throw more shots downfield. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, Matt, let's stay with you. LFVOL says, uh, the D-line was great, but where was Hobbs? Was he hurt? Hobbs was not hurt. He just didn't play. Um, the big man takes snaps. He did not. And do you see him bulking up to stay at defensive tackle in 24? Or are they going to bump him back outside like they originally thought? You know, I mean, I think with him, he's a guy who move all over the front. I don't think there's a set position for him. Maybe I'm wrong there, Brent, but uh, I mean, I, I think you can, I think you can do a lot of different things with him in, in a lot of different packages. Um, he's got the frame to add more weight. He, he's got the quick twitch ability to play. You know, more on the outside as a five technique if you need to. I just think there's a lot of different things you can do with him, and I don't think you limit a guy like that. Yeah, and I think part of that's going to be where are you with Omar Norman Lott? Where are you with Elijah Simmons? Where are you with Bryson Eason? All those guys who have the availability to come back for another COVID year if they want to. Um, if they all come back, and I don't know that all of them would come back, but if you get the bulk of that group back, then, then, then I think you have some flexibility with what you do with Hobbs. If those guys are out the door, then I think Hobbs has got to stay inside just because of your numbers game in there. Um, you know, but my guess is Hobbs ultimately ends up being inside. I don't think Rodney Garner Rob makes a comparison to Richard Seymour, <laughs> uh, which is a little much, even you know, really a lot much for Rodney. But for him but to make that to make that conversation that discussion that tends to lead me to believe that they think he's an inside guy in terms of being able to maximize his potential inside more so than outside. Yeah, but, but don't you also think it's just a matter of, you know, how big he gets? I mean, I don't I don't think he's a guy that, you know, they brought in and said, oh, you know, you've got to put on 40 pounds no, no. and move inside. But I, I just think it's – he's athletically – it's just where, you know, where, where, where you fit when you when you get done bulking up. Yeah, and I, and I think I think it's going to be easy for him to put on weight because he's not playing AAU basketball, he's not yep. playing winter yeah. basketball, and all of a sudden now instead of running up and down the hardwood every afternoon and running suicides, hey, let's go in here and see how many more plates you can put on this bar and lift, um, and see what your body then, does when you do that that you've and, never done before in your life. And take this jar of peanut butter home with you. <laughs> <laughs> and these four shakes, have those on your way out the door, <laughs> Rob. Got a question here about Joey Halsey. How would you grade him as OC I mean, yet? I, I think it's important to differentiate here. The question says, how would you grade him as an OC? I think a lot of people just think OC play caller. We don't know yeah. how many plays he's calling. We I don't, assume I, Josh, I thought, Josh Hopper's uh, calling the plays. Hubber, I think that was you that addressed that, I mean, addressed that in the chat the other night. You know, who, you know, how many plays is he calling? I mean, we, we don't know. I mean, it's certainly you know not like Josh is going to come in and you know, give us a spreadsheet and break it down. He's like, I had you know the first three series. I gave Joey the fourth. Doesn't sound you like know. Josh, no. No, I don't. I don't think so. So, I mean, as a, as an OC, I would have to say they're getting better. I mean, if you look at Florida game as a baseline and what what we saw them this, this last time, so I'm, I mean, he's learning on the job. But again, I just I just think this is an offensive coordinator job that has Trady Wills on it. Personally, I mean, maybe 
I'm oversimplifying that, but I mean, I, I think if you grade this OC, you, you grade the head coach at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, if the head coach gets all the praise for getting somebody open all the time, then the head coach gets criticism yep. for not getting somebody open all the time. Now, I think that as he and Alex Golish worked together, Matt, I think Golish had more, uh, much more say and was much more involved in play calling. And it was a little more of hypo suggesting things, you know, right now it may be more of Josh saying, Hey, what are you seeing up there? You know, what, what if we get into this set? What if we get into this series of plays? What do you think about that? As opposed to, Joey calling everything and then Hypo overriding a few of them here or there. So I, I think it is training. And I think right now, Joey Halsley as a play caller um, is very young in his training as an, o, as an OC. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think when you, you look at this, everybody, I think you summed it up, Brent, you know, Josh Hopple gets the praise for it. You know, you see the, Twitter, Josh Hopple's in his bag. It was never Alex Golish was in his bag. It was Josh Hopple's in his bag. Josh Hopple schemed Jalen Hyde over him. And I think to to your point, it goes back to the same thing with Joey Halsley here. But the difference is is that Alex Golish and Josh Hopple had, had done it for several years together. And I think because of that, it, it was one of those things where Josh Hopple making more suggestions to him, whereas now it's, you know, leaning on Joey Halsley. What do you see in the booth? I think that sums it up pretty well. Let's go to uh, I Miss Denarius Moore. Wesley Walker Love played his best game in orange and white on Saturday. What are you laughing at? I love that screen name. It 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 may be my favorite screen name on, on Ball Quest. I'm still waiting for I Love Lennon Career to pop up. Uh, all right, so Wesley Walker played his best game in the orange and white, ironically in black jerseys. Uh, what holds him back from playing with such decisiveness every week? Is it a lack of a consistent pass rush, or is it him? Um Brent, you talked about Wesley Walker, five tackles, four of which ended drives. He was all over the place. Why what a great, hu- what a great hover stat, by the way, EC. What yeah. a great hover stat. He made, he made, he made some big plays. I, I think it was the defensive front. I mean, look look at look at where Gabe Judy Lolly was on the first series of the game uh, with, with a tackle at the line of scrimmage, basically. He, he refused to get picked, um, but but he he immediately ran with the receiver. He, he, he didn't take one backpedal step. I mean – I think this secondary believed early on, Matt, that the defensive front was going to get there. And after about two series, they went, oh, they're absolutely going to get there. And I just don't think they were afraid of getting the ball thrown over their head because of the way the defensive line was playing. I just think they they squeezed everything down, which is – I'll give Will Overstreet a ton of credit, okay? We're, we're on the Big Orange Countdown preview show on the Vol Network, and Will's been talking about this for two years. He said, listen, in the NFL, we had a deal. If we blitzed – and the DB got burnt, we own we owned giving up that play because we didn't get there as a defensive front. If you can get pressure and, and, and be a consistent pressure team up front, whether you're blitzing or not, it's on the DBs to squat and go make a play. And and Tennessee's DB squatted. They went and made plays. They didn't there wasn't a 10 yard cushion coming off the ball. Whether it was Xavier Leggett or whoever, they just they played tight, and, and as a result, they were in a position to make plays. Well, I'll go back to talking to Martell's Carter this week. Four star safety, student of the game. Dad's been a head coach at, at the high school level, so he's really he's really studious in everything that's going on. What stood out to you about this game? What stood out to you about the Tennessee defense? Very first thing the four star safety says is the way the defensive line got home. Because as a defensive back, you have the flexibility to go make plays. And I think that's the difference for Tennessee. When, you're, when you've got James Pierce coming off the edge, you've got Tyler Barron coming off the edge, you've got an interior pass rush presence, you can just go play. I mean, it's just, it's just so much more freedom to know that Spencer Rattler can't sit back there and, and chunk the ball over your head. You can go up and you can make plays, and I think that's got a lot to do with the decisiveness for Wesley Walker on Saturday night. Well, yeah, and Rob, I think that was – I mean, I, you know, they can all talk about it's a new year, it's a new day, it's a new week. We're worried about – that That secondary was embarrassed by what happened to them had, in South Carolina. Had, I think the whole defense was, but yeah. the secondary in particular. I mean, yeah, and I, I think it showed. I think it showed in the way they played. They, they played with a – 
it felt like their preparation was different. Like they were in hip pockets and knew what they're doing. That, that one was personal for those guys on Saturday. The question is, can they continue to do it? But they certainly did it Saturday night. Yeah. I mean, I'll give them credit. Cause I would, I mean, I, I don't want this to sound harsh, but to me, even if it was personal, I didn't, that didn't necessarily mean to me that they could get it done. I mean, they hadn't right. you know shown that in the past and I, you know, I, and yeah, they got a huge assist from the defensive front, but I didn't know if the secondary was capable of playing like that. If, you know, if they were playing behind the 85 Bears front seven. I mean, I thought, I thought the defense a- played bad on purpose last year at South Carolina to teach the offense a lesson. <laughs> not, not, wanna- I don't have a 10 foot pole here, but even if I did, <laughs> <laughs> one of the silliest things I've ever heard in my life. Okay. Uh, let's move on quickly. Nashville 615 says Gage Ginther update. Matt? Yeah. You know, I think AP will have something there, more there with him later this week, but kind of what I gathered going into the Colorado trip was that this was a visit he was taking with some family and some friends, um, you know, to be around them more so than be a recruit. Expect him back in town in November when Georgia comes to town, if not earlier, um, we'll see. But, you know, I, I think right now Colorado's got some some work to do if they're going to try to pull a flip off for Gage Kent. They're never say never. I mean, again, it's easy for you to get out there and, you know, realize, hey, this is just right down the road and, you know, it makes it easier on my family or whatever. But I think Gage Ginter is pretty firm right now in his commitment to Tennessee. We'll see what, you know, AP has on him later in the week. All right, we've got plenty more questions to get into, but first let's uh, get a quick word from our friends over at Exterior Home Solution. You know, life happens, and damage to your home can be extremely stressful. That's why it's important to find someone who offers efficient, quality work with financing options. Exterior Home Solutions they value not only family, but community. And they're who I call when life happens, and you should too. As always, a big time thank you for uh, Exterior Home Solutions for being a part of our uh, podcast here, the BallQuest Podcast and the BallQuest Mailbag Podcast. Uh, give them a call today for a free uh, estimate, uh, as well as always. That's at 865-524-5888, or visit them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. Uh, let's move on now to uh, do little ball over under two and a half offensive line starters next season come from the transfer portal. That number seems a little high, Brent, but I mean, we can go, we can break this down guy by guy, but that seems a little high, right? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, is John Campbell coming back? If he, if he's not coming back, um, you're losing your right tackle. You're losing your center. You're losing your left guard and your right guard. I mean, do, do they have three starters waiting in the wings right now on, on this roster as as their second team guys? You know, Addison Nichols, we're, listen, I'm not trying to be critical of Addison Nichols, but we've been talking about Addison Nichols taking a step for months. Yeah. You know, that hasn't happened. I think Vice and Lang's the guy they think can be their center of the future. Um, but but where are some other guys going to come from? Now, maybe that's Sham. Maybe Sham, you know, has a great deal, you know, really gets going here. Maybe some other guys show up, but um, I, I don't know right now that you say, hey, th- they definitely have three or four starters available for them on this roster um, as offense, as young offensive linemen. M- maybe they do. We'll see how they develop moving forward. But, I, I mean, I think you got to go, you know, get four guys, probably get four guys out of the portal. And I don't think you're getting four guys to come in and, and fill some – some backup roles. I think you're looking at guys to come in and potentially start. Here's my question though. AP said something about this, um, maybe on a podcast or the chat or something about JJ Crawford, about how JJ Crawford's gone after this year. This is technically his fifth year. So technically could he still have another year of eligibility? Could he and Mincy be the tackles? Maybe if, if Campbell left, um, depends on did, did Crawford red shirt his COVID year? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Did he have a red shirt year during his COVID year? Because they didn't. I, I don't know. The, out there. Over at UT, utsports.com, twenty twenty three just says fifth year. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if he has a COVID year available to him or not. Because I, I, I'll be honest with you, I have a hard time keeping up with, with COVID years. But but even if he is back, you know, as the guy, I mean, is is he absolutely locked in to be True. to be to, to be your guy all the way? I mean, we'll see. I mean, Kirk, where, where's Andre Kirk? I mean. I'm not saying I'm definitely taking the over, but I'm not saying it's definitely the under either. I, I think that's going to be a position come spring practice that 
you got a big sack of potatoes out there that you're trying to find out who your five are going to be. And, and I think you're you're going to be a long ways from knowing who those five are when spring practice starts. All right, let's go over to iHeart Vols. If I remember correctly, James Pierce was a signing day surprise two years ago uh, and inspired the Austin Wink. Also, he had the dog in his lap, Max. Uh, so what does the backstory on his recruitment, what was there, was there presumed that he was going to go somewhere else? Uh, Matt, what do you remember about James Pierce? Because he was a, a, a big get that Tennessee was able to uh, kind of solidify him coming to Knoxville on, on signing day. Yeah, with with James Pierce, it was weird. He, no, nobody talked to him except maybe AP. Um, I mean, I, I, would, I called him a few times and could never get him on the phone, or when you did, it was very brief. Um, you know, but for, for James Pierce, it was you wanted to get him across the finish line during the early signing period because it felt like if he made it to the late signing period, he was going to blow up. Georgia was involved there but never really got him to campus leading into the early signing period. Florida was involved. There there were several schools that were involved there for him, but Tennessee just kept plugging, plugging, plugging and got him to sign early. That's what made it such a big deal was they feel like they stole him before he really had an interesting recruitment um, in that late in that late window. And, man, it's paid off here to start his second season on Rocky Top. Yeah, I mean, I think most people out there thought he was going to be a February signee, and, and I think they wanted to see some – some transcript things and see where it was. And, and Tennessee did all their due diligence and kind of worked quietly in the weeds. And um, there were a bunch of people around the conference were surprised when he signed and a bunch of people were disappointed when he signed, because I think he was, as Matt mentioned on it, on a lot of schools radars, but there was a little bit of a wait and see approach with them. And, and Tennessee didn't wait. Uh, they, they went and got it done. And obviously it was a good get. That's an understatement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's different. I mean, am I am I the only one that thinks that he kind of reminds you a little bit of Micah Parsons? Am I just way out to lunch? Because I put that I put that out there a couple of times, and everybody's just kind of like, whoa, whoa, what? I mean, I know Parsons is more of an inside guy, but but I think James Pierce could stand up and play outside linebacker. I really do. James, James Pierce has an incredible first step. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's incredible. I mean. I, I, th- I, mean, I Bob, think he Bob, can do a, lo- a lot of different things, but just what he does from that, that quick Bob, body wise, he, he reminds me a lot of Leonard Floyd body wise. Just, I mean, I, I mean, James could end up being better than that. I mean, but we're talking about a guy that was a first round pick and has been in the mm-hmm. NFL for, you know, six or seven years. He did, man, what surprised me, and I, we really saw it against South Carolina, was his, his physicality. I mean, I'm not surprised that he's hard to get for a left tackle to get his hands on him, you know, outside. I, I don't think I could touch him in a phone booth. But th- the way he's able to go inside and play with, you know, play with power. And I think a lot of that is, you know, guys are so off balance because they're so worried about him going around him. But he's he's not a one-trick pony uh, at all. I mean, he can he can get in and, and, and push. Well, we talked about this some after the Virginia game. He got home with a couple of speed moves, and then it was like he went to power moves, and they didn't get home. And then against South Carolina, it was like, Everything that he used was every was, trick in the back. I mean, it's just it's everything that he used was getting on. So he's continuing to to develop too, which I think makes it even more impressive with him right now. And this is way this is crazy premature, but just talk the the best pass rusher that I've seen here is, is Derek Barnett. That's not close. But and, and Pierce is just a completely different player than that. I mean, just talking the way you know the different ways that you could get it done out, out there at that position. I mean, I don't know that you know, Pierce could be any different than, than Derek from a you know physical you know, just body type and and the way they play but just super effective when you dip inside and you give up your your leverage essentially and you you're so fast enough to get in there and still not give up contain when they try to get back out i mean that shows you got a special player and you know pierce the virginia game a couple of times he was just so quick and, and still never give up contain doing that um, he's a good player. He's a good player for sure. Uh, Davey Vall says, do you think the staff will look to add more numbers to the wide receiver room this offseason where they have at least 10 scholarship wide receivers? A couple injuries in this team is thin at wide receiver like you are right now. Got to recruit the position better, Matt. I mean, got to have more bodies on the board. Uh, if, yeah. you're taking four, you, if you're taking four, you can't recruit six, right? I mean, you just got to recruit more guys and – um, I, I'm not putting all that on Kelsey Pope, but I, I just think you've got to have a deeper board in high school recruiting. Um, but because you don't, there's not that many bodies to go sign in this class. So 
I think you're probably looking at potentially dipping back down in the portal uh, again th- this off season. Which look, you're going to be attractive to teams in the portal or to kids in the portal. NIL wise, it's going to be costly. Um, but but I think to build that roster number up, two things have to happen. One, you got to recruit more high school kids, and B, you're going to have to play them. And look, they played Chaz Nimrod and, and Caleb Webb in the UTSA game for one reason, one reason only, and, and that is to to make sure they were they were happy. Um, because neither one of them would have been a factor if Brew hadn't got hurt um, in the South Carolina game. Um, now they're going to have to be a factor, but um, it, it's, you know, when you only play three and you don't recruit a whole lot of high school bodies, you're going to be thin there. It feels like they're thin there right now for sure. Yeah, it feels like they're thin there right now, and I, and I agree with you. I mean, really, you look at the board at wide receiver, and it was, I mean, it was just, oh, it was thin. I mean, now, a lot of really good talent, and you and you you land Mike Matthews, who uh, phenomenal talent. You land Braylon Staley, who has really put together a, a great senior season so far. But you know, Ron Wingo, that was always going to be a battle to the finish line. There, there was never a slam dunk there with him. I think you were in early enough on Cam Michael that because of that, you have staying power there all the way until the end of this thing. But there, he's he's a good find. He's a good eval. There's so many other teams involved now. There's no slam dunk there. And then outside of that, it's just been slim. You had JJ Harrell committed at one point. You had you had Mario Bennett committed at one point. But you've never really had traction with with anybody else at the position to speak of in, in this class. And you tried to get some guys to canvas. Don't get me wrong. You couldn't get Perry Thompson up here. You you've got Nye Carr up here, but. I mean, he was committed to Georgia pretty firmly at the time. Outside, there's just not a lot of numbers there, and you have to change that in some way. You have to cast a wider net, and not just at the receiver position, at other positions as well. Vol from afar says, how conservative should I be with my expectations about the defensive secondary, Rob? Uh, Was South Carolina a breakthrough or a result of playing uh, poor on offense? I'm thrilled with the performance but wary that that's not the new norm. I, I, yeah, I can understand I, that for I'm sure. I'm right there. I'm right there with you, buddy. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. Saying, but I mean, I, I think we, what we talked about earlier. I mean, it's. I mean, like Hubbard was saying, it's it's not hard to play defensive back when you know, the quarterback's got to get get the ball out of his hands in under three seconds. So, you know, I'll obviously be anxious to see you know what the secondary looks like when Tennessee plays a better offensive line, which is probably just about every SEC opponent. But uh, the jury's still out. They played great. I mean, you got to tip your cap to them. But that's one game, and, you know, we've seen a lot of bad football from, from that unit. Like, where's that line, Brent? So, like, I, f- I feel like we all thought that the the defensive line was going to be, you know, better, taking a step this year. I thought it was going to be better, um, especially the things you heard about James Pierce and, uh, you know, Omar Norman Law before, you know, and, and during fall camp. But now that, you know, through five games, and again, just two SEC games, a lot of football left, but it looks really good. And so it's like, you're still kind of surprised at how well it's looked, but you kind of knew it was going to take a step. Kind of where's that line, I guess? Well, I mean, I don't think they played very well against Florida. That's I, mean, I, mean, that's I, think, I think they're one and one in the SEC in terms yeah. of their play. And I think if, if Rodney Garner was on this podcast, he would tell you the same thing, you know, that, that they didn't – I mean, he basically said – it was a really ugly life lesson and really ugly learning lesson in the Florida game because you didn't play well enough. Now they took that lesson and turned it into a really productive day against an offensive line that struggled all year long. That's playing with two freshmen. Now James Pierce is a sophomore, right? It's not like it's not like an All Pro was going against a rookie on Saturday night. I mean, really, those two guys have played about as the same amount of football because Pierce didn't play a whole lot last year. Now he was a year older in the weight room, and I, I get all that stuff, but. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I, I think that with, with that defensive line, um, it, it's the challenges are going to get harder uh, because you're going to play good offensive lines. So can you play, um, you know, with, with the type of, of effort, energy, and leverage that you need to play uh, that you played with on, on, on Saturday? Here's the thing that I will say about the defensive line that to me is the biggest positive takeaway is – I thought they took a game plan, Matt, and executed a game plan really, really well because you had to play smart if you were on the defensive line, right? You had to be able to play some contain. You couldn't dive inside if you're Tyler Barron all the time and give up the corner 
Like you had to stay committed to your rush lanes and work together as a group of four and not just a collection of individuals. I think that's the biggest positive step to take away from that game and neutralizing a quarterback who could move around the way Rattler can. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you slowed the South Carolina run game down doing it. You you slowed his. It felt like going into the second quarter of that game, Spencer Rattler got outside the pocket and made a few plays early in that game. It felt like he wasn't going to be able to do that all night. And slowly it became he wasn't able to do that all night. And I think it's just because that group played as a unit overall. Um, you, you had multiple guys making plays, Dominic Bailey, Tyler Barron, Amari Thomas, James Pierce. I mean, you just had guys around the football from that unit all night long. Yeah, they gave him to play, but correct me if I'm wrong, he scrambled. You, you missed a tackle or two. He got out of the pocket and scrambled on third down for a first down on like – the first, the first series. The first series. The very first series, series of the, the game. First, yeah, and you're sitting there and you're like, you're like, all right. Here, here we go. go. <laughs> here we exactly go. exactly what I thought. Well, and, and, and I will say this, and this is not to make – I'm not I'm not making an excuse there. He got outside on the first one because James Pierce got tackled. I mean, tackled. That's, he did. I mean, there, there was – and listen, I know officials aren't always going to throw the flag, but that's the – that's the third play of the game, and the left tackle tackled the defensive end in front of the official and just didn't do anything about it. Did. Um, but, but you're right. They missed a the tackle, and one of those deals were like, okay, it's, it, is it, if it's going to be one of those nights, Tennessee's in trouble. And it turned out not to be one of those nights, Rob. And I was just going to add, I thought Tyler Barron got held all night long. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, you could say that every game. I thought, I thought it was pretty agree. I mean, I, just, I noticed at least four or five times where I was like, man, where's the hold? On Tyler, yeah. it was yeah, it was you know again t- Tennessee went and won and and we're in, was in control of the football game and you can call holding all the time but you know when the nameplate is pulled free from the <laughs> older pad <laughs> as it was for Roman Harrison that's probably a hold when Tyler Barron's tackled and laying on the ground with I mean and gets thrown to the ground that's probably a hold there from time to time as well but. Um, Again, the biggest takeaway is they play together as four, and can they do that against good offensive lines? Or, you know, when your neck is looking the other way because somebody's got a hold of your face mask. Listen, yeah, I know that's a game before. Listen, but. I will say I will say this, and, and this is not a beat up on all those guys or whatever. I don't think it's been a great five games for SEC officials. Um I just I, – there's been some – there's some head scratchers across the league, and you can say that every year, but it just feels like – I mean the explanation on the punt formation deal. I, I no, I still haven't. I still haven't figured that one out. And I've asked some coaches around college football about what that was, and they all went. I, I, I don't. I don't think Mike Eckler is still satisfied with the explanation he got. What do you think, Cover? I would. I would. I would venture a guess that Tennessee probably had some long conversations on Monday and presented. A great amount of evidence as to why they think that was not an illegal formation. Well, but. he was he was steaming already because his unit just gave up a fake punt a couple yes. minutes before, and that didn't help matters. That's, this is for sure. <laughs> huh. All right, let's end on this one. A couple tight end questions. Uh, D. Hale says, uh, "Do you all think? Uh, do you all think we'll be increasing the number of two tight end sets? Warren and McCastles are really big targets. Uh, usually catches the football and can move. Two tight end sets." Uh, Rob, I don't think you're going to see two tight end sets unless you're in the goal line where I've seen this offense do it before. But even they haven't made a habit of doing that. So I, I guess, would say probably no to that. I mean, is it is it in response to, to Brew being out? I mean, I, I just don't I, see I, Josh I would assume Heupel, so, yeah. I just don't see Josh Heupel shifting gears yes. a whole lot from, from what, what he does. And then Big O93 says, if one of McCastles or Warren goes down, we're in a pickle. Do you think Ethan Davis is getting healthier and will allow the offense to use tight ends more in the passing game? Brent, a lot of people are saying Ethan Davis, Ethan Davis. You know, it's two different positions. Brew McCoy, Ethan Davis. I understand Davis played wide receiver at the high school level. At Collins Hill, was a big target and a good player. He's a tight end now in this offense. Now, you know, he was injured for a couple <clears throat> weeks. He's getting healthier. Uh, to, to the to the question's point, um, if one of those tight ends goes down, he's going to have to play. He's, you know, how how ready will he be? And overall, how can the tight ends factor into maybe that passing game? Whereas you lost a big target of Brew McCoy. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, some third down things. I mean, I, I think we saw that little almost jet sweep looking action out there to to Jacob Warren for a 10 yard gain and a first down uh, as a nice wrinkle. That's probably a wrinkle that you adjust to because Brew McCoy's not in the game. 
um, that they targeted, seemed like they targeted Jacob Warren more after Brew got hurt. Maybe you can do some different things like that, particularly on third down. You know, maybe he's your, maybe Jacob Warren becomes your box out guy, right? That, that, that you kind of run some of those, some of those things too. I do think there'll be some tweaks that way. I don't think there's going to be a ton of uh, formation tweaks. I don't think they're going to go to two tight end sets. Um, and if if Ethan Davis is on the field, he's going to be as a tight end, um, spelling someone. He's coming back from an ankle injury. But you're not, Matt, you're just not moving a guy for at, at week five into a new position and expect him to play a whole lot. Now, maybe – Maybe you do move D. Williams to offense and, and trick around with that and see if you can find you know, four or five gadget things you might do with that. But to take an Ethan Davis, because he's a big receiver, was a big high school receiver, and ask him to learn this offense in the open date to learn the receiver position is, is just not realistic. I, I don't know that fans understand all that is involved for the receivers and what they have to read. You know, it's just it, it's not the easiest position. You're not just running a route. You've got to read coverage. You got to read a lot of things. He puts a lot. Josh Heupel puts a lot on his receivers in, in terms of helping themselves get open. Yeah, and I mean, I think with Ethan Davis, when you look at what he did at the high school level, right? You can call him a, a big receiver, but he was just a flex tight end. They they moved him all over in a gadget way. It wasn't so much of a of a. I mean we talk about the things that brew did that goes unnoticed. And a lot of that's from the physicality side. Okay. Ethan Davis played basketball for a couple of years and they convinced him to come play high school football. Like there wasn't a ton of physicality for, for Ethan Davis at Collins Hill. And don't worry, it helps when you've got a Travis Hunter to your left or right to, to open the offense up. But for Ethan Davis, it was more run a route and get open. And, and that's not, what you're going to be able to do with him in this Tennessee offense. Is he athletic? Sure. Can he be physical? Sure. He has, you know, he has the body to do that, but he's still got to learn the tight end position and continue to grow and develop there. You just can't, you can't make that move with him right now. Well, and remember this, about, probably ever. if I'm not mistaken, Matt, was, was Brew not a defensive guy at one point in high school that, that big, was, was a big college time defensive player. guy. I mean, he was not thought to be a college wide receiver early in his high school career, right? Am I, am yeah, I, you're, ta you're, you're talking about a guy that's probably the top edge in the class when he when he was coming out. So yeah, USC was the one that kind of started the wide receiver talk. Texas wanted him any way they could get him. Both of those programs wanted him any way that they could get him. But Bruce McCoy was it looked like he was going to be on the defensive side of the football. Yeah, which tells you what kind of physicality he has, which yeah. is different than a guy who's played, you know, big receiver without the physicality that you're talking about with Ethan Davis. Yep. This podcast is always presented by our friends, Exterior Home Solutions. For a free estimate, give them a call today at 865-524-5888. A big thanks, as always, to Exterior Home Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us here on the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. All the questions every single Thursday here on the General's Quarters. For Matt Ray, Brent Hubbs, Rob Lewis, I am Eric Kane. we got a ton coming up on the site. Even though there's no game this weekend, Tennessee has an off week or a bye week, uh, we got some real cool, interesting content to get you uh, to next week, to get you to game week. So stay dialed in to uh, VolQuest.com and, of course, on the General's Quarters. Uh, for the guys, I'm Eric Kane. Appreciate you being here and listening on the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. 